be looking into the nervous system today, uh, part one of three again for the nervous tissue. So the nervous system itself is our main way of communicating within the body. This is one of two ways that we primarily communicate within the body, the other being the endocrine system. And so with the nervous system, we have very fast control, we have quick control, uh, but the process itself is relatively short lived but it allows us to have that quick input as far as what's going on in and out of the body itself. This requires a sensory input, and so we're going to have some sort of receptor that gets information coming in. We're going to take that through a sensory neuron. That sensory input then comes into a central processing, going to be the central nervous system, where we integrate that information, decide what to do with that information, and then have some sort of motor output. And so we're gonna respond to that stimuli by making a change within the body itself, whether it be internal or external. So in the case here, we have a person is looking at a glass of water. They see the water, so the sensory input comes in, we integrate it, determine that that's what we want, and then the output is to go grab the water and drink the water. And so basic, kind of a process here, but essentially that's what's happening all day long every day is that we are sending some sort of stimuli, we process that information, and then we decide what to do with it. That output may be motor in the sense of skeletal muscle, it can be motor in the sense of smooth muscle or cardiac muscle or glands that is receiving that output information. We can divide the nervous system up into two basic uh, processes as far as what's where we have information. We have the central nervous system and then we have the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system being the brain and the spinal cord. This is where we process all of the information within the loop that we just talked about. The peripheral nervous system is essentially a two-way system in that we have sensory information coming back towards the spinal cord and the brain and then we have motor information going away from the spinal cord and the brain. And so the the sensory input and the motor output both travel through the peripheral nervous system along spinal cord nerves and cranial nerves. So that peripheral nervous system gets divided up into the sensory and the motor side of things. And so sensory information coming back towards the spinal cord or the brain is said to be afferent information. And so this is information that is on its way back to the cord or to the brain itself. This is information about general sensation information, things that we can touch and feel and see and, and things like that that is coming from the outside of the body. And then we also have information that's coming from inside the body. And so we have sensory afferents that are those for general sensations, special senses, things like that. And then we have information that is coming from the organs, and this is the visceral afferents. The large majority of visceral afferent information is unconscious. We're not aware of consciously what is coming back to the brain itself. The motor side of things is our efferent side, so this is going away from the spinal cord, away from the brain. And this is going out to any number of effector organs. This could be, again, skeletal muscle, this could be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or glands as that effector organ. Depending upon the type of information and, and where that information is going dictates within the motor side whether we have somatic nervous system or whether we have the autonomic nervous system. Somatic nervous system is the conscious control of our skeletal muscles. And so somatic is the conscious information that we're receiving, whether it's somatic as far as motor or whether it's somatic as far as sensory, this is the conscious side of the system. Autonomic side is the side where we are sending information out to things like smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. All of those, that information is running along the autonomic nervous system, which is divided up into two divisions as well, either sympathetic or parasympathetic. Essentially turn things up or turn things down. Uh, depending upon what it is. The sympathetic nervous system is going to turn up things like heart rate, breathing rate, uh, it's going to slow down digestion. 
the parasympathetic side is then going to do just the opposite. It's going to slow down our breathing rate, slow down our heart rate, and increase digestion. So they work in contrast to one another. When we start to look at the nervous system under a microscope, and so when we look at the histology of the system itself, we see that we have primarily two sets of cells. And so we have neurons, and then we have neuroglial cells or glial cells. These are the supporting cells. The neurons are the ones that are, in a sense, the functional cells of the nervous system itself. These are the ones that are going to send electrical signals, action potentials, either to the central nervous system or away from the central nervous system. The supporting cells, the glial cells, do just that. They support. And so these are the cells that do everything from keep them healthy to regulate what substances are going to be able to be around them to insulating them, protecting them. Um, they are kind of the, the workers of the nervous system. These glial cells um, are an important cell. They actually far outnumber the neurons themselves and they provide for everything from where to grow when they're early in their early times to how to help them with their production of action potentials, insulating them, protecting them, increasing the speeds of the transmissions themselves. And so they come in several different types of cells. First off, we have astrocytes, and these are the most prevalent of the cells themselves. Astrocytes are kind of star-shaped cells hence their name. Uh, these cells have little processes that go out and essentially kind of grab on to just about everything. They're going to latch on to axons and dendrites, the processes of neurons. They're going to latch on to capillaries, and so they're going to cover all of the, the capillaries that are in and around the brain itself um, and the spinal cord, and this is going to create what's called the blood-brain barrier. So one of the important jobs of astrocytes is to make sure that only substances that can get into the central nervous system are those that aren't going to harm it whatsoever. And so they actually cover and surround and create this kind of like extra covering around a capillary so that they protect them from that outer covering that's there. Next up we have microglial cells. Microglial cells are simply phagocytes and so these are resident phagocytes similar to what we had back in the skin in that these phagocytes are going to be the, basically there to make sure that there's nothing going wrong that should be and so we are going to destroy any kind of bacteria viruses and or just simply cellular debris and so things that may have uh, been damaged or dead cells that have have occurred within the, the nervous system itself, they're going to help to dispose of those. These cells have their origins in the white blood cells and are similar to those of monocytes. Ependymal cells are ciliated cells, and so they have big cilia on them. They help with the production of cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, and so they're going to be found in certain areas within the central nervous system in where we find these little kind of cavities inside there. And so these are our ventricles. And inside those ventricles, we have these ependymal cells there producing CSF. Those ciliated cells help to move the CSF along the surface of the cells themselves. And so this helps to, to keep it, it moving and circulating around through the central nervous system. We have two types of cells that function in essentially helping to protect the axons of our neurons. And these are oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells generate what's called a myelin sheath. And so these are cells that are going to essentially wrap themselves around the one process of our neurons, the axon. And as they do so, they're going to insulate it. They're going to protect it. They're going to allow for similar to like when you have a wire and that wire has kind of the the copper wire on the inside but then it also has the 
the plastic outer coating. The Oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells make that outer plastic coating in a sense. So it's going to keep the neurons being able to fire a action potential very quickly the more that it has that myelin sheath. The difference between oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells, uh, the major difference is where they're located. And so the oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system, Schwann cells are in the peripheral nervous system. So we have two different locations. How they make that myelin sheath is a little bit different as well. And so for our oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, they will send off little processes to multiple axons. And so they're going to cover many different axons at the same time, and they're going to create that myelin sheath. They're going to wrap themselves around it. Versus a Schwann cell, each individual Schwann cell, when it makes a myelin sheath, only surrounds a single axon. And so there are multiple Schwann cells, but each one of those Schwann cells is only covering a single axon. And so here we can see a cross section and we have the myelin sheath here in the, the cell. The cell itself is living, and so our Schwann cell is still functioning, it's still living and everything. And you can see that the myelin sheath is continuous with the plasma membrane. And so essentially all that that myelin sheath is, is a plasma membrane that has wrapped itself around and around and around and around that axon. And so it's squeezed out all the cytoplasm and it leaves just that myelin sheath next to the cell, thereby allowing it to speed up the transmission. The neurons themselves, so our, our functional cells in the nervous system, we have cells that have essentially a long life to them. And so these cells are going to be with us essentially our entire life. And so they're long lived. They don't uh, divide anymore, so they're amitotic, and so they don't have the ability to uh, divide up and create another cell. So if we lose that cell, that's it. We're not going to be able to, to make another one at that of that cell. In the cell body, we have a large amount of nuclear material in terms of the ability to form neurotransmitters, and so we have all of the the organelles that are needed for the production of neurotransmitters within the, the cell itself. And so it has a high metabolic rate. And so it's constantly in need of oxygen, constantly in need of glucose in order to function. Its process that it goes through is that it's going to create an electrical signal. That electrical signal is going to be an action potential similar to what we saw in muscle and similar to where we saw at the neurons from motor, we're going to see those axon terminals release a neurotransmitter that's going to send a signal to the next cell. The cell body, also known as the soma or the perikaryon, is where essentially all of the cell metabolism is going to occur. And so this has the nucleus, it has the nucleolus, it has all the organelles for the most part for making all of the neurotransmitter that it's going to need. And from it, this is where all of the processes are going to grow. And so all of our axons and dendrites coming out of the cell. Since it doesn't divide, we're not going to see any centrioles inside the cell itself. But we do have a extensive rough endoplasmic reticulum, so for making all of those neurotransmitters that we need within the cell itself. Extending off of it, we're going to see an axon hillock, and this is a cup-shaped structure that allows us to have our axons extend from it. And this is going to be one of our primary uh, processes that come off of the cell. So these are the axons. We also have dendrites, and essentially the axons and dendrites are for our communication with other cells. So this is going to form into <clears throat> multiple axons or dendrites from other cells as they coalesce together we either get nerves in the peripheral nervous system or tracks in the central nervous system so dendrites are oftentimes numerous in numbers 
uh, as far as the, the processes goes. And so oftentimes we have a multi, uh, multiple amount of dendrites that extend off of the cell. They branch, they go out, they have varying kinds of uh, diameters to them. These are generally going to be our receptive parts of the cell. They're going to receive signals from other neurons, from other receptors, things like that. These signals then, as they receive them, they generate small electrical potentials that are along the surface of the cell that make their way back towards the cell body. And so these are what we call graded potentials. They're similar to an action potential, but they don't have the ability to send a signal along the entire length of the cell. Axons are the cells that are going to get the information in a sense sent from the cell body, the soma, out towards the next cell, whether it be another neuron, whether it be an, a motor cell or a, a gland, whatever it happens to be, it's going to be the output of the cell itself. The axons tend to be very long, and so some of our longest ones can be several feet long, going all the way from the central nervous system down to like the, the bottom of our foot, things like that. They typically don't branch um, on them. They typically have a, depending upon where they are, these are the ones that are gonna have either oligodendrocytes or Schwann cells associated with them. So those are gonna go out and send those signals from there. So when we look at it, we have our axon hillock. So this cone-shaped portion here is the axon hillock that then extends down into the axon itself. That's there. And typically only a single axon per cell. So we're only gonna have outgoing of a single amount of information. Perhaps there's a branch that comes off. The dendrites have lots of branching. And so many, many different branches on them that are going out and communicating with other cells. So we can have different types of synapses making those connections in different places. And so typically we have our axons communicating towards those dendrites. And so we'll have our axodendritic types of, of synapses, but we can also have an axon synapse essentially just about anywhere on the cells themselves, axosomatic and then axoaxonic. The axons themselves are where we're essentially sending that signal along the cell itself. And so this is going to be able to generate the action potential. The action potential begins at that axon hillock and is transmitted then down the, the axon towards the axon terminals. Once it gets there, then it's going to release neurotransmitter towards that next cell typically. At times, those neurotransmitters, once they've been released, they're going to need to make their way back toward the cell body. And when they do so, that movement is going to be a retrograde movement of those substances. When those neurotransmitters are moving towards the axon hillock or towards the axon terminal, it's going to be an anterograde process. The myelin sheath is an important aspect for our neurons. Uh, this is what's going to allow for the speedy conduction of electrical signals. This allows us for the ability to insulate them, protect them, uh, those axons themselves. And when we have more and more and more of this, it's going to speed up those action potentials that are being sent along the surface of the so we do have two different cells that do this, either the Schwann cells or the oligodendrocytes. And in the peripheral nervous system, we use Schwann cells. And those Schwann cells are going to basically wrap themselves around the axon. And as it grows, it's essentially going to push out one portion of the cell. And look at a picture here. And so we have almost what looks like a hot dog in a bun to begin with. And the Schwann cell is growing and as it grows, it encircles itself and wraps itself around that axon. And so it's increasingly wrapping itself around and around and around until essentially it's wrapped around so much that all of the cytoplasm that was there in that leading arm that was there gets squeezed out. And so all of that is removed and all that we're left with is the 
myelin sheath itself. And so all we have is that wrapping that was left along the, the cell. The outermost aspect then still has cytoplasm in it. And so we still have this component there that surrounds the outside of the cell called the neurolemma. This has the cell body of the Schwann cell. It has all of its organelles inside there, and it's still a functional cell. For the most part, we think of Schwann cells as wrapping around a single axon for a single Schwann cell. And those are what we call myelinated neurons. But we also do have unmyelinated neurons. And so unmyelinated neurons still have Schwann cells associated with them, but that Schwann cell has multiple axons. So it doesn't have the ability to wrap itself around those individual cells. It's still there for protection. It still provides for protection there. But what it doesn't do is create an entire space around the cell that's there that is essentially no longer in contact with extracellular fluid. And so there's a opening out to the outside world in a sense that is all along the cell. They're continuing along the length of the cell. And so we don't get that big insulation factor from the myelin there. In between each of those cells, we have what we call a node. And so these nodes themselves, these nodes of Ranvier, they're the spaces where essentially all of the movement of ions is going to occur. This is where we're going to spread the, the ions into the inside of the cell. And this is where in a myelinated fiber, this is going to speed up the conduction of the action potential because we, in a sense, get to skip those spaces. We get to skip the space in between the nodes themselves. For our unmyelinated fibers, those unmyelinated fibers, they have to depolarize their entire length. So there's no actual coiling around of the Schwann cells on those individual cells. And so there's going to be many axons associated with that single Schwann cell. In the central nervous system, because we utilize the oligodendrocytes, the oligodendrocytes do wrap around multiple cells, but they send out little processes to do so. And when that does occur, that means that the myelin sheaths essentially spread across the cell over a wider space. And so the nodes become spaced out further. This further helps to speed up the transmission of those axons. Since the entire cell is not surrounding the axon, uh, it, there's going to be no neurolemma. So it's just going to be the, the myelin sheath and that is it surrounding that cell. When we start to look at the difference between myelinated and unmyelinated fibers, we can start to see them within the brain and the spinal cord in that collections of myelinated fibers give us white matter and collections of unmyelinated fibers give us gray matter. And so the difference becomes apparent when we start to look at them under the brain and the spinal cord and open them up and start to look inside, we can see those different areas there uh, of myelinated and unmyelinated fibers. Neurons can be further classified based upon essentially what they kind of look like, and so their structure to them. And so what we've looked at so far have been multipolar neurons. And so multipolar neurons have many dendrites that are coming out of that cell body and a single axon. And so it has a single axon that extends out from it. It's in this particular case, it's a myelinated axon and many, many multipolar uh, cells because it has many dendrites. In a bipolar neuron, we have a single dendrite and we have a single axon. And so the cell here is essentially going to be kind of like a two-way communication. The, the communication goes in one direction only. Versus in a multipolar neuron, this information can be coming in from multiple different areas uh, within the body itself. We can also have a unipolar neuron and unipolar neurons utilize just a single process that comes out and it splits into a T and half of it goes this way, half of it goes this way. And when we look at the actual 
process that's leaving, it essentially looks like an axon in either direction. And so it's going to have the appearance of an axon until we get to the very end. And in the very end, we can then see a difference in the axon terminals versus the dendrites that are there. And so we'll see that difference at only the very ends of the cells themselves. <clears throat> From there, we can classify them based upon their function. And so we have, we started out talking about the sensory motor and interneurons in terms of the sensory input, the integration, and the output. And so sensory neurons are afferent. So this information is heading back towards the central nervous system or the spinal cord towards the brain and the spinal cord itself of the central nervous system. And then we have efferent neurons. These are our motor. This is going away from the central nervous system. So we're sending out impulses towards the muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and glands. The go-between between the two are interneurons. And so these interneurons are going to be the processing neurons. And so sensory information is going to send its signal over to the interneurons. The interneurons are then going to process that information, and then those interneurons will send the information over to the motor neurons, and then those motor neurons will send the information out to the effector organs themselves, whatever part that happens to be. And we'll continue looking next time.